Buenas noches con todos. Eh, hoy vamos a tener una presentación que va a ser transmitida en inglés. Eh, la misma van a poder ustedes acceder a eh, YouTube para poder ver la traducción en tiempo real. Les voy a colocar aquí el enlace eh, para que puedan revisar en YouTube la traducción que se va a desarrollar de inglés a castellano. Eh, lamentablemente la persona que iba a traducir nos ha fallado y vamos a utilizar este medio para la, la, tra, la traducción. Eh, el día de hoy eh, contamos con la presencia de Cloyd Steger. Eh, él va a dictar la conferencia Experiencias en la investigación de homicidios en la policía de Seattle. Experience in uh, the Seattle, Seattle Police Homicide Investigation. Él es director de investigaciones en, en Mike West uh, Call uh, Case Task Force, uh, director uh, de investigaciones consultor en la sociedad americana en Call Case en uh, el Colegio de Pensilvania. Ha sido detective de homicidios de la policía de Seattle. Um, nice to meet you, Cloyd. Uh, welcome uh, to um, H International Congress um, of Criminalists and Science Forums. Thank you. Just for clarification, for do you want me to go till six or till six fifteen now? Hmm. Uh, Charles King. Um, Cuando guste. Les quiero más bien que en la siguiente sesión. ¿Quieres Go. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> All right, everybody. My name is, like he said, is Cloyd Steiger. Unfortunately, I don't speak Espanol. I'll try to speak slow enough so somebody can interpret this later, or those of you who are limited e English speakers might understand some or most of what I'm saying. Uh, I'm sure he told you, but I retired from the Seattle Police Department where I spent 36 years, the last 22 of those or as a homicide detective, I investigated hundreds of homicides in, in that time, including serial killers, um, domestic terrorists, mass killers. And I'm just going to talk about two or three cases, depending on how much time we have, uh, as just an example of some cases. I tried to include some that involve forensics that might help us out. So um, the first case I'm going to talk about is the murder of Julie Sterling. Uh, this happened in August, I forget which year, but Julie was, uh, uh, there was a big boat race going on on Lake Washington, which covers the east side of Seattle. And while people were going to uh, go to the boat races, they noticed something over the side of the road. And this is where they went and off to the side. I don't know if my, my cursor is on the screen, but off on this side over here. And they thought it was a mannequin. But of course it wasn't. It was just because their body was a That's what it looked like because she was certainly a little girl named at that time. She was found uh, off the side of the road, like I said. But the two things about the photograph I want you to notice. First of all, the humidity pattern, which is the purplish coloring of her back, is incorrect. If she would have been freshly filled and just in this position, all the humidity would have been down towards the ground because Validity is pulled by gravity to the lowest part of the body. And if you yeah, what you sit there for a few hours, it becomes thick. So you can't slide it thick in time. So she's obviously laid on her back for a substantial period of time after her death. And then we jump it. The other thing I want you to notice is the 
is up here on her left back. You can't tell what it is right now, but that's a small piece of what ended up being a black lot on a garden bank, which would be significant in this case later on. If you look closer, you can see the piece of bag on her back. Also, you can see that she's got marbling going on. In other words, she's, she's in the early stages of decomposition. But she's been, she's been dead for a couple of days. For the time she's coming. Excuse me. When we get her up on the sidewalk, we see her turn her over and we see her writing on her chest. That's an interesting connection for whatever reason to negative it looks like exactly. But what it says is nigger dead on her chest. So someone wrote with a sharpie on her chest. Here you can see a little closer. This is tucked away over here so the first couple letters you can't see, but that's what it says. So um, we have no idea who she is when this first happened. And the next day, I go to the autopsy, she's been manually strangled. That's the cause of death. We take fingerprints, so we put them in the automated fingerprint identification system, or APHIS, which gives us the name to Sterling. Because this murder happened down by a big uh, race, boat race, and the news we were covering the boat race, it was a big news story that day. So we got quite a bit of coverage, not like just your average murder, but we got a lot of coverage. And the next day, I was in my office and somebody called the phone, my office phone, trying to be anonymous, saying that her friend told her that her friend's uncle was at a party on Sunday and he told people at the party that he'd seen a dead woman at a friend's house and she was in a garbage bag. But the fact that they found a garbage bag remnant on her back had not been released publicly. So that was pretty important information. Um, this woman again tried to be anonymous, but she made caller ID. So I tracked her down and was able to track her friend down that occurred this case. And I went and got her, started talking to her. She was actually pretty cooperative. But she told me that her uncle Donnie had been there to been at a party when they were watching the boat race on television. And they told everybody that he'd been at the home of this friend that assumed was Peanut. And that Peanut asked him. To help him move a body, and he showed her one that was inside of a big rubber container, but also inside a garbage bag. And he opened up and he said, It's come to a bath. So, right now, I knew I had the right person. Uh, so, later that day, I went and got this uncle who had a warrant up with the rest, and I grabbed him. And he was pretty nervous, obviously, when I brought him. And I started talking to him, telling me, better tell me everything he knows. And he finally admitted that his friend, Peanut, had. Asked him to come over and he said there was a body that he needed to help him get rid of. And we asked him about Peanut and he, he put him in the car and drove him to a spot and he pointed this house out, which wasn't too far from where the body was spotted. And this is Peanut's house. He said Peanut lives in the basement, but his mother lives upstairs. Peanut's real name was Charles Jack. So he said by the street name Peanut. So, in a long story short, we got search warrants to this house and uh, another house that told us we might be at here, the girlfriend's house, which was uh, I was still really So we got warrants to well, By the time we got the warrants and everything ready to go, it was like two or three o'clock in the morning. So we went to this house, pounded on the door, the mother answered, uh, seen it was home. So we posted her off to that house, had the mother go somewhere else, we went to the girlfriend's house, uh, seen it in bed with the girlfriend, and then we left the This is the stairwell leading downstairs to the basement where Peanut lives. This is the area that this Donnie, our witness, said his body was in. So you can see it's pretty, pretty disgusting down there. If you go all the way to the bottom, one of the things you'll notice is that you can see in this case, there are these cans all around and there are bottles. They were filled with urine because he was just peeing cans of bottles up to go upstairs to the bathroom. So it's some great magic. And this is where the murder occurred. This is the big uh, container that the body had been in prior to them touching the body. This is where we found it. Again, terrible scene. This is all 
and urine in bottle of bottle of lemon. That's Charles Jackson. I always look at him. His story was ridiculous. Who, uh, the story was at first that he picked her up and they went down there to school about some beer and that he tried to, uh, he went to take a drink of the beer and he actually picked up accidentally a beer can with some of his old steel urine in it and was drinking that and there's a bottle cap inside and that she'd ingested it and killed somebody. He tried to civilize the story. Which, of course, was a ridiculous story. We told himself. We, uh, we actually got a can of pop and found a little bottle cap. It was like a small airline liquor bottle cap. And then we put it inside the bottle can of pop, pop and took a couple of drinks of it. We finally drank the whole thing and the cap never came out. We told him that he was lying about his story. And then he said that, uh, okay, I was at the cap and they were having sex. And her throat was against the dresser and she died that was Obviously, another ridiculous story. Um, we ultimately, Found uh, peanut DNA in Lisa's fingerprint, uh, fingernail, and matches the probability of the one in six with a billion people to try. So he was convicted of the murder of uh, two mysterious witnesses in the story. Yeah, this next case I'm going to talk about is Cafe Racer. Cafe Racer is a little bistro kind of in North Seattle near the University of Washington. A uh, coffee bar during the day and a liquor bar in the evening when they have live music. There had been a guy in there the night before this incident who was kind of crazy. And he was a regular there, but they told him he couldn't come back and they kicked him out of the river. So the next morning, the cafe raised the price. The next morning, um, when people were in there having coffee, this guy came in and came in the same school. And I have a this is a video. I warn you right away, it's very graphic. But this is, he went in and talked to this barista over here and asked him for a cup of coffee. And he said, You're not supposed to be here, you're going to have to leave. But he said, I, I just want a cup of coffee. So the barista said, If you get a cup of coffee, you go, then you have to go. So here's the video of the intuition the morning of the case of this case. There's no sound. So that's the institution right there. Everybody's regulars there. The people at the bar know him. They know the issues there. He's having a conversation with the police right there, but you're not supposed to be there. This is a Wednesday, Wednesday morning about 10.30 or so, or 10.56 it says. I was uh, at the medical examiner's office when I got the call to respond to this case. First guy gets put up and just starts shooting everybody in the, in the bar. He goes around the side and shoots people like under the bar. And he casually walks over, picks up the hat of the first person he shot, puts it on his head, and walks out. Pretty shocking. This is the scene when we got there. Obviously, blood everywhere. Some of the some of the victims have been transported to the hospital and died there. Others were dead at the scene. This is this truck. We had a, we had a license plate that a turkey drove, and we this was taken from an automatic license plate reader. Some police cars, a lot of parking vehicles have cameras on that record the license plate of every car and they go by. This was actually a couple of days before the shooting, but it gave us an actual picture of the truck we were looking for. So, like I said, this was a, obviously this was a mad scene in the middle of the day. There were, uh, by the time I got there, there were medics and fire engines and 15, 20 police cars. And it was kind of uh, while we were there, one of the sergeants walked up to me and said, there's a shooting downtown and they're asking for homicide. Did you go check that one out? So I said, okay. So I got in my car and I drove downtown to an area 
near Thruway Park called Ethan Seneca. And this is Ethan Seneca. This is, again, it's about 25 minutes to 30 minutes after the first meeting. And the distance between these two, two scenes is probably four or five miles, but it's heavy daytime traffic. And you'd be lucky to get down there at about time to the drove. But this woman uh, was parking her car to go to a business in a building there, the building called Town Hall. And she just parked her car and went to walk away when somebody walked up to her and just shot her in the head without saying a word. And then they stole her car. So I'm looking at this scene and I see that the, the gun unit is a 45, 45 caliber pistol. So I called up, they transported her to the hospital, by the way, where she was around dead. So I called up to the senior cafe racer and I said, is that a 45 that was used in your case? And uh, of course I talked to her, I'm not sure, we haven't got inside yet. I said, well, let me know as soon as you know. So a few minutes later, he called back and said, yeah, this is 45. So this is a lot of violence going on one business afternoon in Seattle. And I, thought, I, I think this might be the same guy. They did that shooting. Yeah, I, at that time, we didn't have anything. It wasn't until later we got the video. I had in the back of my mind that this might be the same guy. So a while later, we get a call that her car has been found in West Seattle, which is about another eight miles south. Now, the first shooting was north, about 67 miles. This is right downtown in West Seattle, where her car was found. It's southwest, so about another seven or six or seven miles southwest of this. Street. So we respond out to there. This is the woman who was killed, Gloria Leonotis. Uh, she was a, a married woman with a, a husband and two teenage daughters. She was killed for different reasons. So we, this is her car. It was found like this on the side of the street that she was taken in. She was shot. It was found on the side of the street in West Seattle. So we went out there and everybody was looking. I uh, talked to a neighbor in one of these buildings who said, I saw a white guy get out of the car and walk across the street and there's a bus stop across the street. So we thought he might have gone on a bus, but we didn't. Everybody looks at this. This is me here and people in my squad. People look at the car. And on the front seat is a 45 caliber handgun. So I don't know if you noticed in the shooting at Cafe Racer, but it looks like they had two handguns. They were both 45. So we had we recovered one of them inside this car. We didn't know where he was. A while later, uh, an undercover detective thinks he spots him farther south in West Seattle. So he calls over the radio to the uniform patrol officer. And now this has sound, I'm not sure if the sound's going to play on this presentation, but it doesn't really matter. But I'll play this. This is the in car video from the patrol car that comes up on Ian's Wiki. Let's see what else. That's Ian Stewicki walking down the sidewalk. So he shot himself in the head. We didn't verify that that was Ian Stewicki, the same person that did both the students who did at that scene. Uh, he was a mentally ill man. Families and friends for the last few years, and couldn't because the laws at the time. But uh, he, he told us that there were seven people killed in the earlier two shootings with him. I think he's the eighth, or he's or sixty-seven. So that was a busy afternoon. But that was the uh, match. His gun with the police, all the shell casings at both scenes. This case I'm going to talk about briefly is Ali Muhammad Brown. Ali Muhammad Brown, uh, well, we got, in fact, on June 1st, I think it was 2014, at about 2.30 in the morning, I was called at home to a double homicide in the central area of Seattle. I was told that there were two black males dead in the street at this address. So this neighborhood, which is the 29th and Anyway, this is an area 
there's a lot of gangs that in there. There's been a lot of gangs that in there. There's a lot of folks that are out of there. Not necessarily homicides, but shootings. So I assume when I got the call that this was going to be another gang shooting. So I drove to the scene, coming out to King Street, Seattle. And this is what I find when I get there. There are two men dead in the street. Uh, they've been shot most, most of the time. One of them shot once or twice, but the other was shot like seven times both range of the face. And when you're looking at the assault like this, you get someone shot most of the time in the face. That usually means it's personal for whatever reason. Psychologically, it's personal. Either there is a personal affront against this person or they're transposing this person to somebody else. It's personal for me to them. So that's all I had that uh, this person was down the street, these people, and you know, not much information. But what I did find out later on, well, first of all, like all these who done it cases, we got information about possible people involved very early and went on wild goose chases all over the place. They ended up having nothing to do with these murders. They sounded really good at the time. That's why uh, I tell people, if you're a good homicide detective, you go with the evidence taken. You don't decide at the beginning what happened and then try to make the facts all fit your theory. If you have a theory and you go down the road with it, you go to a Come to a dead end, you have to stop and go back to the beginning and start all over. And that's the difference. We wasted two or three days because somebody had called his brother telling him he shot somebody in the face that night. And we tracked that guy down. It ended up he had nothing to do with this case. So I don't know what that his conversation with his brother was about, but we had to go back to the beginning when we did. So, like I said, we thought this was a simple gangbang, except for when I pulled their ID and ran their name. Found out that neither of them were gangbangers and neither had any criminal history. Matter of fact, they were both employed young men. They were both, one of this, this guy here in the dark shirt, was actually short in Japan, Japanese and was going to move to Japan. And uh, we didn't know what this was all about. We found out that they were both gay. They, were, they weren't gay partners together, but they were both gay. We found out from family and friends pretty soon. So we had that. We had there was evidence. There was there was wallet laying there. Um, one of them had been wearing a baseball cap with a zip thrown into the fake a lot like this. Where he was leaning on the hat brim where he threw it. The witness saw that. We're trying to figure out what's going on with those guys. We end up uh, doing a phone dump on their phone. Just you know the phone dump. There's cell writers something. We put the phone in. We download all the data. The spreadsheet computer program. And we find out that. Uh, one of them, this guy, without the shirt on here, he was wearing a shirt, it was cut off by the medic. That he had been calling, uh, he, they, they called people, I'm sorry, I got this back, the guy in the dark shirt had been talking to somebody uh, a little before midnight, which is like two hours before they were killed in the phone. So we figured out who that person was, and we went to them. And what he told us was that they were in the one, that's his name, this is a bar called Our Place, gay bar on Capitol Hill in Seattle. And he asked this guy to come down. He said he was there with Ahmad, who was the guy with no shirt on there, and Ahmed, excuse me, Ahmed, and come down to come down to the apartment. So the guy went down there and he said he knows the one who well, but he doesn't know Ahmed very well. He said Ahmed was on his phone the whole time. And he said he thought he was on Grinder. Now if you're not familiar with Grinder, it's a phone app for gay men other day. And he told everybody he was meeting somebody outside the club after closing. So after closing, they went outside and there was a guy there. And two people I talked to that were there said the guy was weird, he was different. He didn't seem gay and they tried to be friendly to him and people didn't really talk to them. And so uh, it's it like three or four days in, the first time we hear that Ahmed had a car that they, the man and the other, these two guys and the other guy walked to Ahmed's car. And again, like I said, we had no idea Ahmed had a car. Nobody mentioned their car was missing. So that was the first thing we learned to do. But they, they offered the other two rides, and the other two turned them down because they said the guy was too creepy. 
So we went up to the area, had our people to the area. There's several shell cases here, nine millimeter shell cases. Ends up a little later, but up there. But these casings come back as likely from the Smith and Wesson M plus C nine millimeter. This must be said for military plus three. Nine millimeter. That's the kind of weapon that will absolutely look. That's a close up of the of the uh, it's stamped in the uh, firing chain impression. As you can see, it's Luger 9mm SP. We find this surveillance video a block from the nightclub. This is Ahmed. This is Juwan. This is the guy they met. The Luger the killer. This clock. Had not been changed since daylight savings. It's actually 2:04 a.m. that this was taken, and it's only and it, it's 18 minutes before the 911 call came in, and they're about a mile and a half or two miles from the shooting scene. So we're pretty sure this is our shooter, but we have no idea who he is. In the meantime, once we we find out that there there's a car, we put a bulletin out asking everybody to look for this car. This, this is a picture of the two victims in life. This is Juwan, and this is Ahmed. Again, now, Ahmed is Muslim and gay, and that will come in um, later because uh, Muslim don't like their people to be gay, okay? Char so we find a, I'm sorry, go ahead. Charles screen, PowerPoint. You can't see the PowerPoint? I don't know, see. I'm sorry, I don't understand what you're saying. Uh, well, don't know, see the PowerPoint. Nobody sees the PowerPoint? Mm-hmm. Uh, share screen, please. I did share screen. Let me go back and do it again. Nobody has seen any of the slides I've done so far? <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Okay. Now I'm at share oh, screen. Let me, let me go back to the PowerPoint. See. Can you see this? Can you see that screen? Can everybody see it? Cesar, can you see that? I'm going to assume everybody can see this. Let me, I might have to go back to the beginning of this case. You missed the whole other case. Did you see none of the beginning of this presentation, Cesar? No. No. Hey, a... Okay. Well, I'm going to show this video first. This is the one I was talking about from – can you see that now, the screen? Yes. Okay, I'm going to show this video because this is the video from inside the cafe racer I was talking about. So let me show this because nobody saw it before. This is so this is the uh, that was kind of a waste. Okay, here we go. That's the InstaWiki walking into the cafe racer. I'm sorry. I thought everybody could see that. I hit share screen before. I don't know what happened. We'll just kind of skip through this one kind of quickly. You missed the entire first case, but we'll just keep going from there. Okay, this is what I was talking about before of the scene, what it looked like inside. I'm going to go pretty quickly because 
I don't know what happened before. These are all the people inside. That's the car from the license plate reader. This is where the second shooting happened, or the, the second incident happened downtown. That's where the 45 caliber casing was found that matched the ones from the scene at later on in uh, at the Cafe Racer. That's the victim. This is the car that we found in West Seattle. There we are working on the car. That's one of the 45s found at the scene. And this is the video when the police find him in farther south in West Seattle. And I'll play this again. That's the InstaWiki walking down the sidewalk. That's where he shot himself in the head. Okay, now on to Ali Muhammad Brown. We're going to go back to this. I'm going to kind of go a little quickly now because we're behind. There are the two victims in the street. Again, uh, nine millimeter casings, which later were determined to be from a, or the opinion of the scientist was it came from a Smith and Wesson M plus P nine millimeter. That's the head stamp. This is the surveillance video with Ahmed, Jawan, and this person who we didn't know at the time was our killer. Later ended up being Ali Muhammad Brown. So this is uh, this is uh, Ahmed on the left and Jawan on the right. Okay, so we put the bulletin out for the car. And within a very few minutes, a uh, patrol car found the car in southeast Seattle, uh, quite a ways from where this murder scene happened. On the passenger side, you can see the blood flowing down from the uh, rocker panel there. And there's a lot of blood. So now we know that the shooting started inside the car. We find more casings that later match the cases at the scene, nine millimeter uh, M and P uh, Smith and Wesson casings, or that's what the opinion of the lab tech was. And there's another one in the back. This is Ali Muhammad Brown. We do the uh, have the back a person process it for fingerprints, and then the back seat window behind the driver, they find a palm print and they match it in APHIS, the Automated Fingerprint Identification System, to Ali Muhammad Brown. This is Ali Muhammad Brown. We start putting, uh, start looking at him, find out he was arrested down in um, Shasta, California, a couple months earlier. And at that time, he'd, be drive he'd been driving a silver Dodge Durango, and he got arrested there for a while and let go of the impounded Durango. So that's all we knew about him. And the day that we did got this information, uh, we work, I work for the city police, Seattle city police. So we do the things in the city. The county sheriff does things outside the city that are not in other cities, what we call unincorporated areas of the county. So one of the county sheriff's detectives happens to call our office. Our, we only at work across the street from each other, and we're friends with those guys. And he calls and he says, hey, well, look, I'm, I have a murder I'm working on um, where the suspect was driving a silver Dodge Durango. If you guys ever hear about a Silver Dodge Durango, let me know. And I'm like, are you kidding me? Because I just literally found out that day. So I call him up, back up, and I, I say, what are you looking for the Durango? And he says that there was a shooting in April, which is a couple months before ours. It was just a, a drive-by, and it appeared random, where a guy was shot for no apparent reason in a surveillance video shows a Silver Dodge Durango. So he, I have him come over, and I show him, the, I asked him what kind of prints, uh, what kind of casings he had. And he says they're nine millimeter at Luger, just like mine. I show him a copy of the head stamp. He goes, those are just like ours. So we use the same crime lab. I called the crime lab and I said, I want you to compare my casings to his casings. And I got a call back a few minutes later that they said, those murders were all committed with the same weapon. So now we know he has committed another murder 
just outside the city a couple months earlier. That's the guy that got killed. Uh, he was he went to the store. He is not he has no criminal history. He went to the store to be, buy his dad a bag of chips, or excuse me, his uncle, a bag of chips and some uh, soda. And when he walked, when he was walking back to the apartment they lived in, somebody drove up and just shot him multiple times for no apparent reason with the same gun. So it's the same weapon. It's a silver Dodge Durango. We're presuming it's probably Ali Muhammad Brown. Well, the first thing we did because it was Ahmed uh, Saeed's car is we called the family because, you know, if you find fingerprints in the car, it doesn't mean that's the killer. It just means they were in the car. So we asked the family, because they're Muslim, and Ali Muhammad Brown is a Muslim name, if they knew the name Ali Muhammad Brown, they said they'd never heard of him. So we start doing some research, find out that he's been arrested previously for um, trying to raise money for ISIS in the Middle East. And he was, when he was younger with his older brother, he's a radical. he's radicalized. So we start long, it's a long story and I won't go into it now because I won't have the time, but we start tracking everything he's at. We, we track him to a, uh, a condo building in North Seattle and we put it under surveillance. At one point, the silver Dodge Durango shows up there, but it's driven by his wife and some kids and we watch it for a while. And then finally it drives away and, and some other people follow it. They stop it, get out and they tow the car away, do a search warrant and they find more casings from that weapon in the car but Ali Muhammad Brown is nowhere to be found so I get a call from a detective in New Jersey clear across the country who is investigating an attempted carjacking and he said that this guy tried to carjack somebody in this town little town called Point Pleasant Beach New Jersey literally we're on the west coast it's on the east coast of the United States 3,000 miles away and uh, but it was a it was an uh, manual transmission and he could not uh, drive a, a manual and transmission. Long story short, he was able to identify the guy. The guy fled and got away, but he was able to identify him uh, because the guy had been in a restaurant the night before and failed to pay. And he gave a phone number of his brother who would give a credit card number over the phone. And he, and he kind of fooled the brother into telling his name and it was Ali Muhammad Brown. And he had a uh, surveillance photo of Brown in a nearby store. And I verified, yes, that's our guy. That's Ali Muhammad Brown. And he tells me, you know, up in West Orange, which is uh, up in uh, New it's right across the river from Manhattan in New York. There was a kid that was killed for no apparent reason a couple weeks ago. And I wonder if it's the same guy. So I call the detectives in New Jersey. And at first they kind of go, no, we think this was a robbery. Uh, you know, I don't know. And I said, what kind of weapon did you have? And he goes, well, it was a nine millimeter and they think it's a Smith and Wesson M and P. Well, I tell him, you know, that's what our guy is now. He's, he's killed three people in Seattle and we think, you know, it's probably him. So I said, when you run out of leads on the robbery, give me a call back. So what they do is they put their, their uh, casings into NIBIS, which is a national ballistic system computer. And it shares it with, it compares it to the ones in our case, and this is a ballistic laboratory report that says that the uh, the, the the bullets used in, in that case, which, by the way, a 19-year-old kid was killed for no apparent reason, matched the casings at our murder in Seattle. So now we know he's still killing. He's on the East Coast. Well, that makes him a serial killer. What if that was a gangbang is really a serial killing. So we start looking into, into things going on there. This is the kid that was killed in New Jersey, 19-year-old Brev, uh, Brendan Tevlin. He was back in um, New Jersey from his freshman year at the University of Richmond in Virginia and had been at a friend's house and playing video games. And about 11 o'clock at night, he called his mom and said, I'm on my way home or texted her, but he never made it home. And they got a call of shots fired near an intersection, near this intersection, which is in a very nice area. It's not in the ghetto at all. It's in a very nice area in West Orange, New Jersey. And they got there and they found casings in the road, but no um, no car, no body, anything like that. Well, a, bit, a little bit later, about a mile down the road in an apartment building, they find Brendan's car and Brendan's body is stuffed on the passenger side on the floorboard. And he's been shot multiple times with a nine millimeter with the same nine millimeter that killed uh, our victims and killed the one in the county. So um, they start looking for him over there. And eventually some officers find him behind a house overlooking Manhattan 
kind of camping in the woods, and he has that weapon on him, and they arrest him. So we fly to New Jersey. That's Ali Muhammad Brown in New Jersey. And we go to interview him. And it's a, a long story, a long interview. But eventually he confesses, and he said that he is on a jihad, and the murders he's committing now are in retaliation for all the Muslim men and women that have been killed in, in Iraq, Iran, and I mean, Iraq, Syria, and Afghanistan. And so, you know, he says it's, that's what he's doing. That's his jihad. And so he intentionally did it. And he would have killed more, but he got caught. So we had to go back there for a pretrial hearing. But then before he went to trial, he actually pled guilty. And when he pled guilty to the murders there, he said, yeah, and I killed those people in Seattle too. So there he is after his uh, conf or his, uh, guilty plea, and he received uh, life. He was convicted of terrorism. That's the first ever case of terrorism by a state court in U.S. history, by New Jersey especially, and um, aggravated murder and was sentenced to life without the possibility of parole. He has since been uh, extradited to Seattle. He has yet to plead guilty here. We think he probably will. But he hasn't yet, and uh, and we'll see what happens. Okay, the next case I'm going to talk about is Shannon Harps. Shannon was a uh, young girl. That's her right there. She moved to Seattle from Ohio because she um, loved the outdoors and wanted to work in the wilderness. And she went to work for the Sierra Club, which is a uh, environmental group, national group, and she she just wanted to do that. Well, on New Year's Eve in 2007, she was home in her apartment on Capitol Hill in Seattle when she was invited to a New Year's Eve party. It was only like 6.30, 6.15, 6.30 when she got the call. She said, yeah, so she decided to walk to a couple stores to buy them some things she could bring with her. She went to a nearby Safeway store, which is a big supermarket chain, and bought some stuff. We got video of that, watch her go in, come out. Uh, nobody seemed to follow her. Everything seemed fine. Then she went to a different store the opposite direction, and there was no video there. But when she walked back, she walked down a sidewalk past two people standing on a corner. And to get to her apartment, there is a stairwell that goes down to a door. And somebody followed her down to that stairwell. And at the bottom of it, he stabbed her to death. The person stabbed her to death. When I got there, um, right behind her apartment building, was a building called Seattle Mental Health. It was, of course, closed. It's not an inpatient hospital. It's just where people go outpatient. And people had said there was a weird guy sitting on the steps, and he was drinking Pabst Blue Ribbon beer out of bottles and throwing the caps in the street. So we went out there, and sure as heck, there was Pabst Blue Ribbon beer bottle can, uh, beer bottle caps in the middle of the street. And we thought that was interesting. Maybe this was the guy. So, of course, the people processing the scene, we told them, pick up all these beer caps, a few minutes later, uh, a patrol officer about five or six blocks away stops a guy in a bus stop. And this guy is drinking beer from a Pabst Blue Ribbon bottle. Now, Pabst Blue Ribbon is sold here and people drink it, but it's not its not nearly the most common beer people drink in this area. It's more unusual. Uh, so they had the witnesses brought over to look at this guy. And both of them said, no, that's not the guy. I said, okay. But I thought, you know, he's drinking the Pabst Blue Ribbon beer. Maybe he's the guy that was that was throwing the beer caps out there, but he didn't do the killing. But let's take him down to eliminate that lead, right? So we had him sent to our office. And a few minutes later, we went down. I think that's him there, James Williams. We went down to the office and started talking to him and uh, about what he was doing. He said he was sitting there drinking. He said a police dog came up to him. And the officer told me, better be careful. You're going to get bit. And he said some guy was there with him, told him about somebody getting stabbed. He didn't know nothing about it. So I, of course, asked if it was okay if we swab his cheeks, and he said yes. The next day, we let him go. The next day, we bring one of those witnesses in, and we have a composite artist sit with him, and she makes this – this is the composite that the witness says that the suspect that did the murder looks like. So you can see it looks nothing like James Williams. Let me go back to James real quick. Let's see. There's James. There's the suspect. So I put this out in a bulletin system, and I get a call from the Department of Corrections, like parole officers. And one of them tells me, this guy says, I have a guy on my caseload who looks a lot like that sketch. And he said, he's kind of psychotic and has violence issues with women. So he gives me the guy's name, and I run his name. 
His name was William Ball, and that's him. And I go, wow, that looks a lot like this guy, right? And so I, he, like I said, he has a he's psychotic, has a history of violence against women. So we start looking for William Ball. After a day or so, we find him, and he's got a he's in violation of his probation. So we find him and have him brought to our office. And when he's brought to the office, um, he has scratches on his nose. Let me see. I think I have that a picture. There's a scratch on his nose up here. You can see it closer. I'm sorry. Scratches on his nose and something on his hands, too. Whoops. I didn't have that one. Anyway, he has those scratches on his nose. And we ask him how he got that, and he's kind of vague. We start talking to him about uh, – that night, New Year's night, what did you do? And he starts telling us about his whole day, starting in the afternoon, where he went, what he did. Then he admits that he was in the neighborhood where Shannon Harps was murdered that night. And he admits seeing police cars and hiding from them. I said, why are you hiding from police cars? And he said, I don't know. And he said, at 7 o'clock, which is just before the murder happened, he says, I blacked out. Of course, we've all heard I blacked out means I did it, usually. So he was in there for three or four hours with us, and he never, ever asked why he was there. Never once said, what's this all about? Nothing like that. So I was pretty convinced he was our guy. But then he finally, finally said, you haven't asked, aren't you wondering why we're talking to you? And he goes, well, I was kind of wondering. I said, well, we're investigating a murder that happened up there that night. And he said, oh, I didn't do any murder. So I asked him to take a swab from his cheek, and he let me. And then we booked him into jail for his probation violation. I submitted that to the crime lab, and a couple of days later, I got a result back that said William Ball is not your suspect. We let me tell you where we got the we found the knife laying in the ground outside the stairwell, and we got the DNA from the handle of the knife. Shannon Harp's blood was on the blade. It was a kitchen knife. It was all bent, but there was male unknown male DNA on the handle, and it wasn't William Ball's. So we were back to square one. In the meantime, I submitted that DNA swab I'd taken from James Williams just for an elimination. And I get a call, and they tell me that James Williams is our killer. Okay, now, the witnesses were brought to where he was stopped just moments after he was stopped. They both said, that's not the guy. And he walked right past him. And then they, they, they did this drawing that looks just like James Williams. Looks nothing like, I mean, excuse me, looks like William Ball looks nothing like James Williams, but William Ball was not the killer and James Williams was. As it ended up, William Ball and James Williams only lived about a block apart. So after this happened, I think they might have been up there together. I don't necessarily think William Ball had anything to do with the murder, but I think he was with James up in that neighborhood and they saw him. And that's why this all this happened. So we brought James down and there's quite a... Uh, Quite a long process. I put this bulletin out for uh, James Williams. There's a long process, and there's a long video of my interrogation with James. And if we had more time, I could show you. But in the end, he basically, at first, he denied any knowledge, and then he started crying and told us that he'd done it. And he, he described in detail how the murder went down. He was sitting there drinking the beer, saw her go by, followed her into the stairwell, and and started stabbing her. And I said, did she say anything to you? He said, James. And she, he said, she put her hands on my shoulders and said, get off me. And I just said, die, bitch, and kept stabbing her. And he said he didn't know why. And he was crying and upset. He said that the, the knife blade, this is one of the things when you're taking a confession, especially guess, from a mentally ill person, you have to look for corroborating facts so you know it isn't a false confession. What he told me was the knife blade bent while he was stabbing her. And, of course, we found the knife blade. It was bent. So that told me this is the real guy. He really did this. It's not a false confession. So he pled guilty um, at trial against his lawyer's in, uh, advice and was sentenced to 50 years in prison. And that, that's all I have. Unfortunately, I, my first part didn't work out. Is, does anybody have any questions or anything you'd like to say, Cesar? I don't know if there's anybody here that speaks English to ask a question. 
<laughs> yeah, that's right. Many criminals do have a malicious and deep look. That's right. They have you look into the eyes and there's no soul. I'm sorry the first uh the first murder scene didn't show up on the PowerPoint. Um I don't think we have time to go back and show it now. Let's see. Mm. Thank you uh, very much. It is a honor. It, Cloyd uh, Steger is. Uh, a ver, voy a mostrar. Cloyd Steger is un importante autor de libros de investigación. Ya ha estado mostrando diferentes casos en relación a asesinos múltiples y asesinos seriales. Lo conocí justamente debido a una exposición en India. Eh, no comments. Ok. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay. All right. If you need anything, you can email me. I'm sorry the PowerPoint didn't work at first. Fortunately, we kind of got through it. But thank you. No, no problem. All right. New times, uh, new problems. Okay. All right. <laughs> thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye.